The Thing Creature, anatomy, timeline, real form, and future of the franchise explored in detail. It's an act of acute cruelty to discard a film just because it doesn't agree with prevalent notions and ideas of filmmaking or because it disagrees with mainstream trends. But every once in a while, there comes a film that breaks these worthless barriers to become a masterpiece in its own right. John Carpenter's The Thing is one such beauty. The film was released in 1982 at a time when people were drowning in the trend of man in suit type aliens like xenomorphs or jovial aliens like E.T. Under these circumstances, John Carpenter threw his unique and new extraterrestrial that wasn't just killing people, but also creating a sense of paranoia, suspicion, and dread. Hey, fuck you, Palmer! I'm going with you! Who says I want you going with me? All right, cut the bullshit! Was the world ready for such a beast yet? No, critics and fans still wanted an alien that they were accustomed to. The Thing was released just two weeks after Steven Spielberg's iconic flick, with critics giving it a reaction that was as cold as the film's setting. They failed to comprehend the entire use of paranoia and distrust, when in fact these were the prime themes and the most significant contributors that would make it a classic in the coming times. It is beyond doubt that 1982 was not the year for John Carpenter and his film. It was way ahead of its time. Glory came only after it was released on home video and later on television. In 1998, the DVD version gave additional content such as a detailed documentary on the production, alternate and deleted scenes, and commentary by Carpenter and star Kurt Russell. Following this, they released an HD DVD version in 2006 and the Blu-ray version in 2008. With successive releases, more and more behind-the-scenes content was provided. Other life forms. So what's our problem? The thing's not dead yet. By now, the thing was being watched, understood, and appreciated by more dynamic minds. But Roger Ebert discarded by saying, it's out. It is okay. the most nauseating thing I've ever seen on a movie screen. Other critics hailed and lauded as one of the best films of the sci-fi horror genre. People were now able to look through the creature and embrace the nihilistic and depressing viewpoint that the film presented. America was in a recession that was highest since the Great Depression, and this was indirectly a theme of the story. John Carpenter's film is an adaption of John W. Campbell's novella, Who Goes There? In 1951, Campbell's work was adapted in a black and white sci-fi film named The Thing from Another World, but this one was merely a vague adaptation. Carpenter stuck to the novella's original story and focused on the compelling idea that the alien can shapeshift into any living creature around it. John read the novella a few times and drew parallels between it and Agatha Christie's 1939 mystery novel, and then there were none. This helped him build suspense right till the finale. We believe that had it not been for the ambiguous ending, the narrative would have lost the charm. In fact, Kurt Russell, who was playing the alcoholic pilot, suggested to John that the conclusion should be as bleak and confusing as the film itself. Ultimately, two of the most contributing factors behind the thing's continued success are its brilliant special effects and the element of a total loss of identity. Apart from its excellent setting, what makes this terrorizing piece of cinema exceptional is the treatment of its monster. While other alien films tend to hide their creatures behind corners and dark alleys, John Carpenter was bold enough to show his titular antagonist to audiences in the first few minutes. The Thing has the perfect amount of gore and viscera to satiate any gorehound's hunger. Initially, special effects artist Dale Kuypers was brought in to bring the creature to life, but he got involved in an unfortunate accident. This forced Carpenter to bring on board Botten, whom he had already worked with in the 1980 film The Fog. Botten collaborated with comic book illustrator and story artist Mike Plug to finalize the creature designs. What's most fascinating about the film's alien is that events happen at bullet speed. For instance, in the chest chomp scene where the doctor loses his hands, the creature takes no time and grows spider legs from a human head. Stan Winston also did some uncredited work when Botten was hospitalized due to overexhaustion from work. With such great minds working on John's film, the special effects were deemed to be brilliant. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Yeah, fuck you too. Number one, what is the creature in John Carpenter's The Thing? It's prudent to give you a quick recap of the 1982 film and its 2011 prequel. So in the original, a group of scientists make their base camp in Antarctica. They are soon visited by a Norwegian helicopter that's after an innocent sled dog. As the Norwegians open fire, the Americans shoot the chopper down and keep the dog in their kennel. 
The dog reveals itself as the Thing, a creature with unimaginable hostility. The Americans visit the Norwegian camp and learn that the Thing is not from this world. Soon, everyone becomes a suspect. The 2011 prequel, which Matthias Van Heinington Jr. directed, revolves around how a group of Norwegian and American scientists found the alien and the events that led up to the first film. Most videos that talk about The Thing tend to give only a small mention to John W. Campbell Jr. and his 1938 novella, Who Goes There? We'll do justice to this author and focus on the cultural impact that the novella has left. But before that, let's deep dive into the creature itself. When Campbell wrote the novella, we don't think he had the faintest idea that people would study it intricately even after more than three quarters of a century. Learning about the thing's intelligence, biology, process of replication, and assimilation is as fascinating as the creature itself. Unlike most creatures, the thing doesn't have a specific anatomy or physical form. It simply replicates the organism that it devours. The replication takes place on a genetic level and it seems that flowing blood helps in the process. The Thing is an old monstrosity that has been to thousands of planets and assimilated with millions of species. The genetic information of all these species has remained within it, just like the genetic data of our ancestors is embedded in our DNA. When it comes under a threat, it falls back to convert into any of those monstrous beings from outer space. Like we saw in the 1982 film, it can transform the chest of a human into a massive jaw with razor sharp teeth just like how it could grow spider legs from a person's head. In the dog thing, it developed numerous tentacles from its body. It's a master of rearranging its anatomical, cellular, as well as genetic makeup. The thing can produce organs like the nose, eyes, and ears, and is capable of functioning without them as well. We assume this is an ability it gained by devouring more developed species in the past. Not surprisingly, the creature's anatomy makes it highly resilient to extreme cold, but it's vulnerable to fire because fire damages its body on a cellular level. It's most vulnerable as well as dangerous when it is threatened or when it's in the process of assimilation. At this moment, it bursts open inside out and allows a variety of strange and terrifying entities to be seen. However, the most peculiar and exciting aspect of its biology is that all of the parts of its body act as individual organisms when under attack and fight for survival. So eliminating the monster completely is difficult as a part of it may be thriving in a corner and waiting for an unsuspecting victim. The thing is a master of shape-shifting, but in order to replicate a host, it first needs to come in direct physical contact. The victim is left under suitable circumstances with the creature, its body opens up and reveals several appendages and tentacles that attack and consume the victim. Once that's achieved, it analyzes and copies the molecular structure. It presumably starts digesting the victim on a micro level before eventually taking a complete physical form. It would be an oversimplification to say that the thing wears its victim's body like a cloak, but this assessment is not entirely false. But wait, the thing will replicate only those organisms that are alive or were freshly killed. There could be two reasons for this behavior. First, it might raise eyebrows and suspicions if the thing duplicated an organism that was known to be dead for long. Another possibility is that the assimilation is furthered by fresh blood. The blood might work as a carrier for the hostile cells to take over the host cells. For instance, in the 1982 flick, when Norris Thing kills Copper, chopping his hands, Copper shows no signs of morphing. This could be because Copper bled to death before the Thing's assimilation could trigger and complete. However, once the thing completes the assimilation, it takes over and copies every aspect of the host. From habits and manners to strengths and weaknesses, everything gets imitated. This is made possible because the parasitic alien mimics not only the host's physical body, but also the brain. If I was an imitation, a perfect imitation, how would you know if it was really me? This ability helps it to look and function exactly like its host. Once assimilated, it assumes the memory and intelligence of the target, which helps it to blend with others without being discovered and choose when to attack. One man's tool is another man's weapon. Interestingly, the thing fails to be selective about which attributes of the host to undertake, so it also gets the weaknesses. For instance, Norris Thing acquires Norris's weak heart in addition to other traits. Circumstance that the thing gets split into two, both the bodies start acting as separate creatures with independent and exclusive thinking as part of its defense mechanism. Replicated things try to infect other organisms, but if the target is too powerful for the parasitic alien, it adds biomass to the body and attempts to overpower the victim. Although there are no definitive ways to find out just by looking if the thing has infected a person, many argue that those who are uninfected have a subtle illumination in their eyes. I thought of the test. 
So what? Is that supposed to clear him? Well, why Bullshit! Why would he come Shut here up, and take man. a Nintendo? However, there are other ways to find out about the replicated. Like many infections, the good old blood test comes to the rescue, but this blood test doesn't involve much science. You just take a hot needle and touch it with sample blood. And because the thing's blood acts like an organism, the blood kicks in its own defense mechanism and becomes hostile. The only one that could have got to that blood will do you last. In the 2011 prequel, Kate concludes that the thing can only replicate living organisms and not non-living materials like metal. So she checks for tooth fillings in the mouths of the crew members. If there are no metal fillings, that person might have been copied. One may ask what the point of assimilation and replication is. Well, the thing has the singular agenda of replicating as many organisms as possible and reducing the number of enemies. Ultimately, it would take control of the entire planet. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's one. McCready was right, and it's not the thing's intrinsic nature to get violent at every instance. It's a highly intelligent and perceptive organism that waits for its victim. It hunts, but does so with extensive planning, and the execution is mostly successful. So it seems that the thing's ultimate goal is world domination, making it nothing more than a parasite. But Peter Watts wrote a short story named The Things, where he narrated their original story from the alien's perspective. There The Things say it was an explorer, an ambassador, a missionary, and a soldier. The Thing talks too highly of itself and goes on to say that its goal was to reshape the unfit one into a fit one and that it held infinite knowledge and wisdom that it received from the deepest corners of the cosmos. However, this piece of work by Watts can be considered non-canon. But we perceive the thing the way Campbell intended us to. This brings us back to the fact that the creature is an extremely intelligent being. Proof of its intellect lies in the 1982 film where we are told that Blair Thing was inventing a makeshift spaceship by using the parts of a defunct chopper. Blair was a biologist for the American crew and he couldn't possibly have the prerequisite knowledge to construct a spacecraft. It is obvious that the Blair Thing was using the knowledge of the original alien which was gained by it assimilating with other more knowledgeable organisms. I'm all right, I'm much better, and I won't harm anybody. Now you gotta let me come back in. Having said that, the thing's intelligence is directly proportional to its size. Its smaller forms tend to either attack as an instinct because they lack an advanced brain or nervous system. For instance, a sample of blood tries to attack because of its lack of intelligence. The spider head's instinct is to hide, but a fully developed human thing or dog thing blends with others and hides. The Blair thing knew that it was under immense mortal threat and as a result, it was trying to escape and fight another day when the situation was more favorable. In the 2011 prequel, the Juliet thing showed higher intelligence and attempted to utilize an extinguishing gas to save itself from burning. Number 2. Timeline of the Creature Presence on Earth A deleted scene from the prequel had a detailed story about the arrival of the thing on Earth, and amalgamated dynamics created the pre-production artwork and a fully functional animatronic. Several thousand years ago, a spaceship of aliens conducted interplanetary zoological expeditions. They visited various planets and collected the species from those planets in containment pods. One of these species was the thing, and it assimilated with one of the aliens from the spaceship and didn't stop until only the pilot was left. The alien pilot crashed the ship on Earth in an attempt to destroy the thing. However, the parasitic creature froze in the cold climate of Antarctica. A hundred thousand years after the crash, a Norwegian crew at Thule Station discovers the spaceship and the frozen creature that was trapped inside it. They brought the frozen alien back to base and Dr. Sander Halvorsen desired to take a tissue sample from the being. Joyous by his monumental discovery, most of the crew indulges in celebration. To everyone's surprise, the helicopter co-pilot, Derek, notices that the alien has broken free. The crew then divides into groups to cover more ground to search for it. The first casualty of this chaos was Henrik. He was pulled by the thing and had started the assimilation when it was burned down. However, they later find a dead dog in the kennel. Meanwhile, Derek, pilot Sam Carter, Griggs, and Olav decide to take the helicopter and bring back help. But the mission immediately fails when Griggs transforms and creates a bloody mess on the chopper, crashing into the mountains. By the end, a Norwegian pilot arrives at the site to find the facility destroyed and the remains of the two-faced thing. That moment, Lars's Alaskan Malamute bolts out of the debris and runs. Lars and the pilot chase the dog in the helicopter. Now how's this motherfucker wake up after thousands of years in the ice? And how can it look like a dog? I don't know how. The 1982 film begins with a Norwegian helicopter firing at U.S. Outpost 31. 
The passenger of the helicopter, seemingly Lars, blows up the chopper and himself as the pilot fires at the dog. In the act of self-defense, the station commander shoots down the pilot and the dog easily sneaks into the outpost. American helicopter pilot R.J. McReady and Dr. Copper leave to investigate the Norwegian base and find the charred remains of a humanoid organism, which they bring back for the biologist Blair to perform an autopsy. Blair reveals that the organism has human organs. Meanwhile, Lars's sled dog is kept in the kennel with the other canines, and it is here that we get to see the magnificently icky dog thing. The chaos at the kennel alerts the crew and child burns the dog thing. Panic engulfs US Outpost 31 as the events of the Norwegian base are about to be repeated here. As the film progresses, it gets grimmer, darker, and more claustrophobic before culminating in a bleak ending that is people scratching their heads up until today. The 2002 video game deals with the aftermath of the events of the US Outpost 31. The US Army sent two helicopters to inspect the situation. The Alpha team was ordered to visit the Norwegian base while the Bravo team went to US Outpost 31. Blake, North, Burroughs, and Weldon of the Bravo team inspected the site and came across McReady's audio tape. Nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. They also found the semi-constructed makeshift spaceship that the Blair thing was making. Bravo team rigs the base with C4 charges and blows up the already destructed camp in the hopes of killing any aliens who may have survived. Upon losing contact with the Alpha team, Blake insists that he should be dropped at the Norwegian site as he was the one who couldn't speak Norwegian. Blake met Carter, Cruz, and a paranoid Pierce who asked everyone to take the blood test. All but Blake and Pierce prove to be imitations. They come under heavy attack from numerous alien things. Blake kills whatever the thing monsters he could find, and Pierce commits suicide. However, the game adds another element to the story, the greed of humans for power. Blake rescues a researcher named Faraday who was working for Gen Inc. under the command of Whitley. Whitley intended to weaponize the thing and its powers as a virus named Cloud Virus. He also subdued and sedated Blake and took him to the research facility. Faraday revealed that Blake's DNA made him immune to the thing's infection. After a disagreement about using Blake as the test subject for the cloud virus, Whitley shot Faraday and tried to escape the facility with the weaponized virus. Blake confronted him, but Whitley had injected himself with the virus and sought to flee Antarctica so that he could infect all of Earth with it. Blake soon saw a helicopter landing at the helipad and asked the pilot for help. The pilot agreed and they both managed to kill the Whitley thing. When Blake asked the pilot his name, he said that he was R.J. McReady. Number 3. What is the real form of the creature? The original form of the thing is shrouded in mystery, but two prevalent theories seem more plausible than all others. First, upon reading the novella by Campbell, you'll come across a vague description of the thing. Campbell described it as having crawling worms on its head, something like Medusa's snakes. The creature also had three bright red eyes and the color resembled fresh blood. The famous horror magazine Fangoria held a drawing contest in 1981 and asked people to draw what the thing would look like. Interestingly, the winning submission of the Fangoria contest was uploaded on Instagram in 2018. However, these hypotheses could have been wrong because we know that the thing is a master shapeshifter and could have assumed these grotesque figures by imitating some other alien. So, finding the true form of the thing is like figuring out which came first, the egg or the chicken. Although the chicken and egg problem has been solved by science, we cannot take the help of science to discover a true form of a fictional alien. This leads us to the second plausible theory. It's as simple as that. The thing has no true form or anatomy. It's just a living creature that assembles with others. John Carpenter himself mildly substantiated this hypothesis, and he agreed that real thought was given to the original form of the alien because no one knew for sure what it truly was. However, screenwriter Eric Heiserer and director Matthews Van Hygington of the 2011 prequel did consider things. The 2011 prequel was to feature a similar three-eyed monster, but it was ultimately scrapped from the picture. All things said, Marvelous Videos thinks that it is best to describe the thing by the actions it takes and the decision it makes in a bit to further its plan of escape, survival, and gradual overtaking of an entire planet. The discussion about its true physical form would turn out to be endless, like a circle, so it becomes imperative to describe the creature with a completely new vision and based on unconventional parameters like defining it based on its actions and instincts rather than its form and anatomy. Well that's suicide! Not for that thing. It wants to freeze now. Number 4. 
future of the franchise. There are talks of a reboot by Blumhouse Productions and John Carpenter himself. The reboot will place the film in a more contemporary setting and expand on the thing from another world, published by Dark Horse Comics. These talk about McGreedy's story after he managed to escape the dauntingly cold weather of Antarctica. It is speculated that the film would take notes from the expanded version of the novella. Interestingly, before his death, Campbell sent a box of manuscripts to Harvard University. In 2018, author and biographer Alec Navala Lee discovered an unpublished manuscript with the title Frozen Hell. This is, in fact, an extended version of the original novella and can well be called a novel. All right. We've got to bring this whole place right down into the ice. Nevertheless, the question remains whether we genuinely need a remake of the film. The 2011 release was marketed as a prequel, but it looked more like a remake. It didn't try to expand on the original film and always worked in its shadow. Yes, we do get a hint about the origin of the thing, but apart from that, we got the same old recipe of claustrophobia, paranoia, and fear. A new film based in the world of John Carpenter's The Thing is always a welcoming move, especially when he is expected to be attached to its production. However, we cannot help but fear the worst. We all know how badly the reboots of classics like Psycho, Total Recall, and Conan performed. We sincerely don't wish the same fate for John Carpenter's The Thing. We'd be grateful if you let us know in the comments what you feel about this new project and what your expectations are. Hopefully, someone from the production team will take a note from our humble channel. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. If a small particle of this thing is enough to take over an entire organism, then everyone should prepare their own meals.